consider a circle this morning. Theoretically, it has no beginning and it has no end, right? That's why the circle is a sign of eternity. It doesn't start anywhere and it doesn't go anywhere. It just loops around and around and around upon itself. And no matter where you get in on the circle, eventually you'll make your way all the way around. I suppose that's true for every shape, though, isn't it? A triangle would do the same thing. But for some reason, it seems fitting that we describe a circle that way, without beginning and without end, just circling over and over. Now think of the year, the calendar. Theoretically, it doesn't matter where we would begin our year, right? We could have New Year's Day on March 13th, on March 14th, the Ides of March, and in fact, the Romans used to do it that way. We could have New Year's Day on January 2nd, just as well as on January 1st, although for those of us who like things neat and orderly, that wouldn't fit, would it? We could have New Year's Day on August 8th. We could have it on December 2nd. We could have it on December 25th. That date has been tried in the past. We could theoretically have it anywhere because because the year is a circle. It goes around and around and around. And no matter where you get in on the circle, eventually you'll go all the way around and touch all the points. Why do we celebrate January 1st as New Year's Day? You can Google this if you want to when you go home, but it's due in large part to a man whose name most of you will recognize, Julius Caesar. When Julius Caesar became the Caesar, the calendar was something of a um, a political weapon because in those days, the calendar was not set at 365 days. There were flex days. And so if your friends were in power, you could add some extra days to the year pretty good, right? If your friends were not in power, you could shorten the year. Political weapons are kind of handy that way. Could you imagine if Congress tried to do that today? If when the Republican candidate was in power, Congress said, all right, we're going to have 375 days this year. And if there's a Democrat, well, let's shorten it to 315. So Caesar decided, you know what, this really isn't a good thing to do. We should have a fixed year. And so January 1st was chosen as the day when the new year would begin. And over the hist- over time, that has just become the way that it is, right? So if you get out your phone this morning, you can scroll through as far as that phone will go. Who knows? It has no end, right? It's kind of like a circle. It has no beginning and no end. And as far as you go, it will always be New Year's Day on January 1st. But it doesn't have to be, does it? And in other parts of the world, in other countries, even to this day, there are other days that are observed for New Year's Day. But why do we do that at all? Why mark out one day as more significant than others? Why have December 31st and January 1st become these days where we remember what has happened before us and look forward to what has happened, what will come ahead of us. Why are all these strange superstitions around that you're supposed to eat black-eyed peas, is that right, on New Year's Eve? And I learned this one this year, you're supposed to eat pork on New Year's Day because the, the pig pushes things forward instead of scratching them backwards. Why do we do these things? Why do we do it that way? It doesn't matter when we start or when we finish the year, but we mark out days because we all know, we all know that it is important for us to remember and to anticipate, to look forward to something new. We don't want to just be locked in an endless cycle. We don't want to be just going round and around and around and around and just repeating the same boring thing over and over again. And so we set ourselves resolutions. This year's going to be different. This year, This year, I'm only going to eat these foods. This year, I'm going to wake up early. This year, I'm going to go to bed early. This year, I'm going to have a workout plan. This year, I'm going to read through the Bible. This year, I'm going to be nice. But what happens? Seems like we get locked in the circle. And what happened last year seems to repeat this year. And what happened the year before seems to repeat again. And no matter what we do, we can't seem to break free. That has especially been pressed home on us since 2019, hasn't it? Last year was repeated again this year. 
And so much was lost, so much was wasted, so much seems to have gotten away that we hope, right, that this year will be different. Maybe there will be something new. This is why we celebrate New Year's, because we long for something that is new. We long to break free from the circle. We long for that circle to actually go somewhere, for it to actually have a point and not just to be going round and round and round and round. And this is what we celebrate in the church, that Christ Jesus has actually brought something new, that Christ Jesus has actually given a destiny, that Christ Jesus has broken us out of the circle of endless repetition, that he gives us a new trajectory, that he gives us something new. And so whether Julius Caesar set the day of January 1st as the day for a new year doesn't really matter to us because what matters for us is what Jesus does. Our lives revolve around him, and revolving around Jesus, there is not boring, endless repetition. No, there is progress, the progress towards heaven. So we celebrate New Year's because, yes, our phones tell us January 1st is the first day of a new year, but we celebrate New Year on the eighth day of Christmas, January 1st. Now, this year, we're a little out of step, but We can all handle that, right? We can do a little time travel. Pretend it was yesterday, the eighth day of Christmas. And what happened to our Lord on that eighth day shows us that he is the Lord of new beginnings, that he is the Lord of new beginnings that do not simply devolve into the same old, same old, same old. The eighth day is the appropriate day because it was the eighth day that was always, sig- always meant to signify something new. Now, numbers in the Bible often have these symbolic meanings, right? You're probably familiar with the number 40 or the number 7. Those numbers repeat again and again in Scripture. And the numbers are not magic in and of themselves. But what God does on third days, or what God does in seven days, or what God does over a span of 40 gives the significance to those numbers. So think of the significance of eight. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And how long did it take him? It took him six days, and on the seventh, he rested. So that seven days, that six days of creation and the seventh day of rest, became the pattern for the week. But it also became a hint that when something new would begin, it would be the eighth day. The eighth day was then the day of new beginnings, and God continued to press that home on his people. He wanted them to be attuned to this because in the flood, how many were saved? There was Noah and his wife, and then he had three sons and their three wives. There were eight people on that ark. When God restarted things, when there was a new beginning to our humanity, it included the number eight. It happened through those eight individuals. And when God gave his people their special mark, when he gave them this covenantal sign that they would be brought into a new relationship with him, that they would have a new status as his people, he told Abraham to circumcise his son on the eighth day. Eighth days in scripture are days for new beginnings. The eighth day was chosen by God as the fit time for new things to start. But new things in scripture, just like in our lives, seem to repeat the old patterns. And so you remember that even though there were those eight humans saved in the flood, what did they quickly devolve back into? Well, the very same things they were doing before the flood. Come, let us build a tower to the heavens. We don't need God anymore. We'll do it ourselves. We'll make a great name for ourselves. And even among God's chosen people, even among those who received the sign of circumcision, that sign, which was meant to signify to them that they were God's people by grace, became something that they boasted in. Seems that new things always, always become old. And yet this was always God's intent to bring new life to his fallen creation, to break us out of that repetition of the same old, same old, the corruption that had invaded our world. And so God gave not just the eighth day, but he also gave this sign of circumcision. 
which we're not going to go into in great detail this morning, maybe much to your relief, but it's important to note that when God gives a sign, he doesn't just say, well, I don't know, I guess you could do something, you could do anything. No, the sign is appropriate to what it is meant to signify. This is why the bath of holy baptism is what it is. We do not sprinkle dust over the children's head. We do not sprinkle something else, but we wash them in water because their sins are washed away. And in the Old Testament, it was circumcision that was meant to be this sign of a new life. It was meant, meant to be a sign that they were getting rid of something old and putting on something new. They were his new people. And if you recall the story of when circumcision came into being for God's people, it helps us see what it was that was gotten rid of and what it was that was being entered. Remember old Abraham? Remember how God called Abraham out from his family, how he called him out from his land, and he said, Abraham, I'm going to give you something new to do. Aren't you tired of the same old, same old? He said, I'm going to send you to the promised land, and there I'm going to give you a son, and in your offspring, all the nations will be blessed. And Abraham said, okay, sounds good. New things are always fun. But what happened along the way? Abraham waited, and he waited, and he waited, and... He never got his son. And so Abraham was talking with his wife, Sarah, one day, and she came up with a plan. You remember this story, don't you? Sarah said, look, Abraham, it's not working out. It's not working out. Why don't you take my my midwife, or why don't you take my servant girl, Hagar, take her to be your wife, and then you can have that promised son. See, God isn't quite holding up his end of the bargain, Abraham. We've got to take matters into our own hands. We've got to work it out ourselves. And you remember who was born from that union. It was Ishmael, right? And God came to Abraham and he said, Abraham, look, I know you think you're a smart guy and you and Sarah think that you have a lot of wisdom and you think that you know better than me and you couldn't wait a little bit longer, but guess what? I'm going to do it my way and you're going to have to trust me. I didn't intend for you to have a promised son with Hagar by your own wisdom, by your own works. It was always meant to be by my promise by my grace. And so he told Abraham that he would have a son with Sarah in their old age. And on the eighth day, he was meant to circumcise that son, Isaac. And the purpose of me telling you that whole story is this. What is signified in circumcision, in the cutting off of some part of the body, is this, that we are to cut off our own wisdom that we are to cut off our own works, that we are to cut off our own ways and learn to depend solely and completely on the Lord God. That's hard, though, isn't it? Because we like to think that we have a lot of wisdom, just like Abraham and Sarah must have thought, this is a really good plan. We like to think that we, ha- we know the best ways to do things, that our works are somehow worthy of God's praise, that we're doing him a favor somehow by the things that we do. But the Lord says to us again and again in Holy Scripture, the Lord says to us again and again in our own lives, lean not on your own, own understanding, but trust in the Lord with all your ways, and he will direct your paths. So on the eighth day, that day of new beginnings, Jesus himself was circumcised. Jesus himself was circumcised and he entered into this new way of being. He entered into this new way of being before his father on our behalf. And he did what Abraham's sons were always supposed to do. He obeyed the Lord God. He took the law upon himself. He who was the giver of God's holy law said, I'm going to become obedient to it. He didn't say, do as I say, but not as I do, but he actually said, I will do all that I have commanded. And on your behalf, this little Jesus takes the law upon himself. Now think of what that means for you this morning. All of the commands of the Lord that we are supposed to do as his creatures, that we should receive gladly and willingly as children of the Heavenly Father, All of those commandments that we receive and think, oh, God just doesn't want me to have any fun. Oh, all of these ten commandments and all of the other commandments, they hold me back from doing what I really want to do. Jesus fulfills them actively on your behalf. And not only does he actively fulfill God's law, but he passively suffers those punishments that we would deserve. For it's right, isn't it, for a father to punish his children? 
If my sons disobey me, if they say, look, Dad, you think you know so much, but you don't know much at all. I know better than you. I'm going to do it my way in my time how I want to do. Wouldn't it be right for me to actually discipline them? It would be. This is what the Lord God should give to us for our sins. But instead, he sends his son, Jesus, to take the punishment that we deserve, to take upon himself the curse that hangs over all of us. Dust you are, and to dust you will return. And all of this, Jesus enters into on that eighth day to show that through his life, through his death, through his suffering, he is bringing something new. And all that is new in Jesus is so wonderfully bound up in this name, Jesus Let's end there today with the name of Jesus. How sweet that name should ring in our ears. This is how we want to begin this year and every year, in the name of Jesus. That name is so wonderful, and maybe it's grown old on us because it's just a matter of fact. Of course he's called Jesus. But just think of how strange it is that God should take for himself a human name. Why should he have a name at all? I sometimes kind of wish that nobody knew my name, right? Wouldn't it be nice to go somewhere where nobody knows your name? I know there was a TV show where that said it was nice where everybody knows your name, but wouldn't it be better if nobody knew you? If you could be completely incognito, nobody could call you on your phone, nobody could say, hey, you, you could just sort of fade away. God takes a name so that we can actually call out to him. Think of the wonder of that. The Son of God is born into our world and he takes a human name permanently. He doesn't say, call me something for a little while and I'll change my name when I get older. No, he says, my name will be Jesus now. My name will be Jesus tomorrow. My name will be Jesus forever. So that when you are in any time of trouble, when you are in any time of need, when you are in any time of fear, you can call out Jesus And what is the meaning of that name? The Lord saves. Here is the new beginning for all of us. No matter how old you are, no matter how many times you've journeyed around the sun, here is the new beginning that never gets old. The Lord saves. It is the name given to Jesus by God, and it is the name that he takes for himself. It is the name that is the killer of oldness and the bringer of newness. It is the name that restores lost sinners. It is the name that boosts up those who have crumbled down and feel the weight of their sin, feel the weight of the crushing burden of sin in the world all around us. And it is the name that Jesus takes so that he may give it to us. Jesus, that name is meant to be known by each and every one of you. Jesus, that name is not meant to simply be known in your mind, but it is meant to be used by you. This is the name Jesus takes for himself so that he may give it to us so that we may use it. And how do you use the name of Jesus? Well, you use it in worship, don't you? You use the name of Jesus by receiving all of the gifts that he has bound up in his name. All that he has accomplished on the cross, all that he has accomplished in his resurrection, he now says, is to be given to you in his name. And so he sends his church out with his name, authorizes his church to publish that name and to bring you the forgiveness of sins in the name of Jesus. He gives his body and his blood under the bread and the wine in the remembrance of his name so that every time we eat and drink of this holy meal, we may receive that name again and again. And as we have received it, so we are to use it, to pray to Jesus, to praise Jesus, and to live in his name. It is good for us to make the sign of the cross, right? It is good for us to dip our hands in the holy water of holy baptism and remember again that he has put his name on me. But what Jesus puts his name on, he doesn't take back. And so when you go out from this place, think of it this way. You go out in the name of Jesus. He has put his name on you. You live in the name of Jesus. You breathe in the name of Jesus. That is true this year. Whatever befalls you, whatever happens to you, whatever kind of trouble you get yourself into, whatever kind of joys you experience this year, it is all given to you in the name of Jesus. 
So rejoice, dear friends, in a new year. Rejoice in another year in the name of Jesus, for in his name there is salvation. Not the boring, endless repetition, not the constant repeat of the same old, same old, but the hope of salvation. To him be the glory now and always. Amen.